Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to begin our session titled Shaping Societal Norms, the Role of Textbooks. Our guest speakers are Parvez Hoodboy, Rubina Segal, A.H. Nayar, Zubeda Jalal, and Samina Rahman. It is being moderated by Amina Sayyad. As you know, Amina Sayyad is our managing director at Oxford University Press in Pakistan and the moving spirit behind the annual Karachi Literature Festival. She has been working to promote Pakistani authors by publishing and promoting their books in Pakistan and abroad and by ensuring that their intellectual property rights are protected. She was awarded the Knight of the Order of Arts and Literature by the Government of France. The total duration of the session is 60 minutes. We would appreciate it if complete silence is observed while the session is in progress. A question and answer session will be held at the end. Please raise your hands and the microphone will be brought to you. Please keep your questions short and precise and refrain from making a statement. Thank you. Uh, so I'm delighted to have such a distinguished panel here with us to discuss the role of textbooks in shaping societal reforms. Um, I'll ask uh, 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 speakers to speak for about five minutes on the topic, and then after that, uh, maybe have a panel discussion among uh, themselves, uh, and then we'll open it to the floor. Uh, I think this is a, a critical topic, uh, and we must, uh, I hope that we can cover textbooks uh, used in Pakistan, both in uh, private schools as well as, uh, as, well as in state schools. Um, because I do feel that they play a pivotal role in the quality of education in the country. Of course, there are many other factors to be taken into account. Um, uh, teacher edu experience and teacher education, the curriculum, the examination system, the, the background of the children. Uh, but I think in the context of uh, teachers who, have, uh, who, don't, who don't have the necessary uh, training or development um, experience, I think a textbook uh, is a very important tool in their hands. So, uh, Dr. Rubina Segal, may I ask you to introduce the subject or talk about your views on the subject? Uh, thank you, Rubina, uh, for inviting me and for allowing me to share some of my views on the subject. Uh, since uh, you said to speak for five minutes, I made primarily five points and I'll make them in order. Um, since I have looked uh, mostly uh, for most of my life at uh, state and official textbooks, I'll focus on those because I think there are lots of different um, uh, organizations producing textbooks now. There are private um, publishers and then there are NGO textbooks and all, uh, madrasa textbooks, but I have focused primarily on state and somewhat on madrasa textbooks. So I'll speak only about those. Other people can perhaps talk more about the private publishing in textbooks. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to start by saying that uh, in most modern nation states, because the present form of mass public schooling started uh, uh, with the modern nation state, uh, post enlightened nation, nation state, around the 18th, 19th centuries. Before that, there was, uh, in the subcontinent, we didn't have mass public schooling. We had the Ustad Shagid form of individual teaching and this whole notion of mass public, uh, lots of students in one classroom together and time periods and half an hour for this subject and the next one is actually a very modern development coming with the nation state. And in the past, uh, uh, knowledge was primarily divine and religious, but over a period of time with the advent with Renaissance and with uh, Reformation and all these movements, of course, science uh, uh, and education were also secularized. There was a secularization of knowledge and of the mind, uh, increasingly so. Um, education, I would say, reproduces the dominant ideologies of the time in almost uh, every country that one studies. For example, and it started in France actually with Napoleon, who was the first one to uh, try and orient textbooks towards a national ideology of imperialism, nationalism, and he also had detailed instructions about <coughs> women and how they should be 
in France. So this is where it actually began. But whether it is the US or India or Korea or Japan, everywhere, contestations, conflicts and quarrels over textbooks have taken place in terms of whose knowledge will be the official knowledge, which group of people, all classes and groups of people, whether they are religious or ethnic minorities, whether they are women or whether they are human rights activists, try to insert their own knowledge into the curriculum. But whose knowledge ultimately gets legitimized as the official knowledge uh, is the group that is most powerful. And uh, like Marx said, the ruling, the ruling ideas are the ideas of the ruling class in every epoch. And uh, the class which has the uh, material production at its disposal also has mental production at its disposal. So they produce and reproduce the dominant ideas. And many ideologies uh, are uh, so prevalent all over the world, including in India, for example, religion, religious nationalism, capitalism, imperialism, and most recently, neoliberalism in education. So these are some of the dominant ideologies. <laughs> A little bit about uh, curriculum pedagogy and evaluation because a lot of the times people talk about textbooks and the curriculum as uh, only, alone. And uh, they don't speak much about pedagogy and evaluation because uh, educationists usually talk about how uh, curriculum is realized in pedagogy but curriculum is also subverted in pedagogy. Because what happens in a lot of the classrooms is that the teachers and students end up challenging or contesting the official ideology and not just reproducing it. So while curriculum and textbooks may be realized in pedagogy, they can also be subverted. And there are many teachers who subvert the official ideology. I once myself did when I was teaching in a school and I was called by the principal <coughs> at the top for saying things against this text, for speaking against the text, for trying to read history or understanding uh, against the official text. So uh, important, uh, importance should equally be given to not only curriculum, which is the what. What do you teach? How do you select out of a vast array of knowledge and choices? How do you make the choice of what to include in a textbook and what to exclude? What educationists call framing. So there's a lot of contestation over that, over content. Then pedagogy refers to how it is taught. How do you contest it? Do you read against the text, do you challenge, or do you just absorb uncritically through rote memorization what is taught? And of course, evaluation is the third part of what is known as the uh, educational code. Um, the British uh, educationist of Basil Bernstein calls this the educational code, curriculum, pedagogy, and evaluation. In evaluation, we have exams through which we test whether or not learning has occurred and whether it has been internalized. And that is the ultimate form of control over knowledge because that determines what will be internalized and what will not be internalized. That controls that you will absorb certain things. I used to tell my students, if you want to pass the exam, write what's in the textbook. Otherwise, uh, this is not true. Yeah, there is an alternative story. There are other stories. But if you want to pass the exam, write what's in the textbook. So basically, uh, evaluation external exams are the form of control uh, and they control what students will internalize. Uh, coming to Pakistan now, the dominant ideologies have been religion, nationalism, militarism, centralism and modernization. During a time, the policy of 1959, the Sharif report, the importance was on modernization develop a modern economy, the curriculum should have a lot of vocational and technical trainings so that you can create an educated technical working class that is that can produce faster for capitalism and can be a better trained workforce for capitalism. And uh, the other ideology was centralization. You had to discourage what he called parochialism, provincialism, regionalism in the textbooks and in the curriculum. So basically what the, that policy did was that uh, civics uh, history and uh, um, geography were put together into one subject and uh, called social sciences in the policy of 59. And that is how each was reduced a little because you were not, you were supposed to discourage anything that was considered too Bengali or too Sindhi or too whatever. You had to focus on uh, basically creating a centralist idea. Uh, when I looked at the textbooks so historically what I noticed was that in the his books that were produced closer to partition 
soon after partition in books, uh, textbooks from the 1950s, there was not such a, an anti-India ideology. There was not so much hatred. In fact, in some of the textbooks, I found that Ram and Buddha and Jesus Christ were praised. Were praised a great deal for their good, for being good-hearted, for being generous, for teaching peace, tolerance, and all that. They were praised. Uh, with the 1965 war onwards, textbooks start to get the nationalism starts to turn inward from this outward going nationalism, let's develop, let's become, let's have progress, let's go into the poverty of nations as a developed nation, we turn inwards and our nationalism becomes increasingly defensive and inward looking. But after 1971 defeat in uh, Bangladesh, with the rise of Bangladesh and rise of Dhaka, after that there is this enormous militarism in the textbooks, enormously the military is glorified. There are pictures of tanks and guns and airplanes and soldiers and Raja Major Azaji's Bharti and Major M. M. Alam and they enter. So massive militarism, massive nationalism enters after 1971 because then your nationalism becomes extremely defensive and inward looking. But then uh, uh, in the time of Ziaul Haq with the policy of 1979 and implementation program of Ziaul Haq, your education turns totally towards the ideology of Islamization, which was being used also on the judiciary and media because Zia um, needed legitimacy at home and it suited him very well to position himself because of the competing imperialism in Afghanistan and the Afghan Jihad. It was uh, easy to position himself as a, uh, and to legitimize his illegal rule <coughs> to Islamization. That's when you get a massive influx of religion and religion-based nationalism and two-nation theory starts to cover virtually every page of the social studies textbooks and also Urdu and English and literatures and even science as Dr. Hupai has shown in his book science <coughs> begins to be taught as though there is Islamic science and the secularization of knowledge ends and knowledge once again comes to be seen more as, a, as divine and uh, basically uh, the sta in the state textbooks there are many others Pakistani states creates many others which are placed in juxtaposition to its own self. Uh, for example, the Hindus are inherently evil. Their caste system is bad. They've always treated Muslims very badly. And there is a glorification of the breaking of Hindu temples at Table and then, uh, the breaking of Somnath and all. There's a glorification of that. And they are inherently evil. But at the same time, there is a lot of, den of um, uh, you know, they, uh, critique of the um, demolition of the Babri Masjid. So breaking Babri Masjid is very bad, it's wrong. But breaking the Somnath 17 times, and that is wonderful. So the, and the contradiction is not the same. And uh, then you come to the Christians. When they are spoken of in terms of imperialism and colonialism, uh, they are referred to as the British or the English. Then in the class, uh, in the seventh, class seventh chapter, class seven social studies textbook, Suddenly they are Christians. The identity changes from British and English to Christians because then they are talking about crusades. So when the crusades are mentioned, they become not English or British but Christians. And of course all the Christians are tricksters and cheats and the British always somehow colluded with the Hindus and somehow cheated the Muslims out of their rights or whatever. So the British are tricks and tricks, tricks, uh, tricksters, the Hindus are inherently evil. The Sikhs are night building butchers. The Sikhs only appear twice on the stage of textbook writing. They appear right after Raja Rajit Singh takes over and then uh, they are uh, presented, depicted as marauders, killers, murderers who come and kill Muslims. And then at partition, when the Muslims are departing to their homeland, uh, the Sikhs appear and they start killing and murdering and marauding. And so these two occasions are reserved for the appearance of the knife building, kirpan building butcher, the Sikh. And the Jews are almost always greedy usurers. They appear in varying representations of Shylock. Uh, you know, because normally, uh, normally uh, Jews are not mentioned very much in Pakistani state textbooks because there are very few living in Pakistan. India is the real threat, which is next door, and out to devour us and kill us. But wherever they do appear, they are always as Shylock. They were usually usurious. And they cheated the Muslims out of a lot of money, they made them poor, they extracted taxes. 
But Jazia is not mentioned. That the Muslims also extracted a lot of taxes from Muhammad. Jazia is not mentioned. Their uh, taxes. And of course, the Bengalis are backstabbers. The backstabbing Bengalis who were actually part of the self, but were not really the self, but not really the other. So who were they? They were Muslims, but they were enemies. So the, the story about Bangladesh is hidden between half-truths and full lies. The story is either not told, or a lot of ex expenditure of energy is done on an alternative story, which is about how the poor Pakistani army suffered in Bangladesh. How they were, the Mukti Pahini treated them, how so poor Pakistanis, they were made to surrender and all, and it was all a conspiracy between the Bengali Hindus and the Indians and all. Nothing about the elections of 70, about only winning the elections, Pakistanis refusing to uh, give the newly uh, elected parties power, nothing about that. All about the collusion of Bengali Hindus with India and then India finally defeating you. And especially the masculine Pakistani psyche seems to be very disturbed by the fact that this uh, woman defeats them. You know, the woman, uh, there was this popular <coughs> song uh, in the days of the 1965 in the Sardar Bangor. Uh, and then the Zalani ends up defeating Pakistan. <laughs> Even I think it's Sukhina. <laughs> so I'll go uh, to my last two points. Madrasa ideology is the madrasa literature incidentally is not focused so much on anti-India or anti-Hindu identity. The madrasa literature, which is called Rad literature, reputation literature of reputation, is much more into um, uh, somehow demolishing secularism, democracy. It's anti-West and women's rights, human rights, secularism, democracy. So the Rad the literature of the madrasas is completely focused on the West very little interestingly on Hindus and on India. It is the state that is obsessed in its national security paradigm with, the, with India. And the last point I wanted to make was something that I've already said, so I won't dwell on it too much, is that texts are not internalized unproblematically. <coughs> Students and teachers do print test texts. Uh, there is the tendency to read against the text, and there is a tendency to challenge. And so there isn't a straightforward internalization of these ideologies. But with the massive turn towards the uh, religiosity that we are seeing in Pakistan, it seems that our, our exam system is managing to create identities that are broken, fractured, and full of hatred. I am so Samira, may I ask you to give us some concrete examples from your long experience? Okay, I will. I, I, I think I won't. I uh, can people hear me? Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you, Amina. And thank you very much, uh, Ruby, as always. You're so crystal clear. And I think that you set the you set the stage for perhaps what I want to talk about, which is really a concrete example of what you do when you contest. As Rubina said that, you know, uh, a text is something which students and teachers often end up by contesting. I wish it were so. It is not very often that it is contested. But on occasions when it is contested, I think that I would like to share with you an example. As Amina said, that I am associated with the Lahore Grammar School in Lahore. And recently you may have read in the news that we came into the public eye and we earned the ire of the government because the Lahore Grammar School or a particular branch of it was teaching something called comparative religion. So we were duly hauled up. Uh, this was as a, if I may just give a brief background. Uh, on the 18th of September 2013, Mubashar Nukma on ARY television had a program in which he accused the Lahore Grammar School. Part of it was true and part of it was not true. Uh, but he accused the Lahore Grammar School of doing two things. 
The first was that he said that they had started sex education in school. And not only that, خوف ناک چیزیں ہو رہی تھیں جس میں سیکس ایڈوکیشن تھی سیکس ایڈوکیشن میں چیلڈرن ور ٹاٹ پریکٹیکل انٹرپورس پریکٹیکل انٹرپورس اور اپارٹ فرم دیت ناک سیکس ایڈوکیشن میں چیلڈرن ور ٹاٹ اپارٹ ابورشن دن ہی پوٹ اپ آن دی سکرین Uh, from the textbook that was being used, which was recommended by Cambridge University, uh, he put up the path of a sperm. He showed the illustration of the path of a sperm and he said, and then he directly addressed Shabazz Sharif and he said, مگر اس کے علاوہ اب اسلامیات ختم کرتی ہے اور یہاں پہ کوئی دین الہی ٹائپ چیز یعنی کہ انہوں نے ایک نیا مذہب جو ہے اس کو پڑھا لکھ کر دیا ہے so we were the actors of the modern age اور اس نئے اور میں آپ کو بتاتا ہوں and then two callers came on both ladies Uh, reportedly parents of the school. In fact, I think they were parents of the school, to be honest. But they were brought on and they said, ki ji, ye abgayad, ye islamiyat chhod diya hai, ye mazhab padha rahe hai, ye ek aur niya mazhab padha rahe hai, ye isaiyon ke baare mein, hinduon ke baare mein, aur buddhis ke baare mein, aur bada ni, kis uh, saare mazhabon ke baare mein, ye in ko padha rahe hai. ایک تو پڑھانے کی کچھے ذہنوں کو یہ چیزیں پڑھانے کی ضرورت نہیں ہے اور جہاں پہ آپ ان کو اگر آپ نے ان کا ذکر بھی کر دیا تو ایسے پڑھنا چاہیے تھا کہ جس میں لگتا کہ یہ سارے مذہب جو ہیں یہ برے ہیں اور صرف واحد سچا جو مذہب ہے وہ اسلام اس لیے کہ آپ نے اس روشنی میں یہ نہیں پڑھایا گیا اس لیے آپ کو جو بھی یہ ہو رہا ہے اور وہ ہو رہا ہے یہ اٹھارہ تاریخ کی بات تھی I think سترہ یا اٹھارہ تاریخ کو تیریس تاریخ کو حکومت پنجاب نے ہمیں شو کاؤس نوٹس کی اور اس شو کاؤس پہلے کہ کس کو آیا جس میں انہوں نے باقاعدہ کہا کہ جی آپ یہ میرے پاس ہے اس میں میں ریلیونٹ پورشن یہ نوٹس کو پرسنل ہیرنگ انڈر سیکشن 3, 9, 11 of privately managed institutions, etc., etc. This video was made, and we have seen that obnoxious content material in Cambridge Book Checkpoint Science School of Class 7 has been included and been taught in your school. Such material is highly objectionable and spoils moral values of students. Hence it proves that such content material instigates the young students towards destruction of ethical values. This was the chapter on reproduction. Uske <laughs> baad, <laughs> I wish that it was so, we might have your problem. But, unhone phir chhapa mara, school mein, bacho ki textbooks li, They also, Unhone Chhapa Mara, all the booksellers in the city that were providing, two of our schools were using these books, but they got some of the facts wrong, but I won't get into those tedious details. Ye kis tarik ko aya, teis tarik ko, we got another show called students. Jis mein the beliefs of the students. This was about now, mostly about comparative religion. The beliefs of the students are being polluted <coughs> and their perspective of Islam is being confused explicitly, etc., etc. Isme hai, the students were openly taught about practical sexual intercourse. I wasn't making it up. This is absolutely part of the Shofar's notice that was sent uh, in the chapter on reproduction on humans. Then it may be noted that the matter is highly sensitive under Article 22 of the Constitution, it is wrong. And they misinterpreted the Constitution. You can't force people to, under Section 292 and 93 of the Pakistan Penal Code, 
whoever puts it into circulation, any obscene book shall be punished with imprisonment or with fine or with both. And this is you know, you have to explain. Aapki registration hum cancel kar denge. And then you are directed in the imminent public interest to stop the use of said books and, uh, you know, uh, so on and so forth. So this was on the 23rd. Then, of course, on the 26th and the 28th, uh, the principal, who also is in one of the directors of the school, had to appear before a committee in which there were two uh, religious scholars. There was the principal of Canadian College University who did not attend the meeting, and then there was somebody else who was also there. The I don't know what his exact designation is, but he is with the uh, But he works with the government. And he runs the Danish schools. And yes, yes. He, so after this appearance, uh, there was silence for a while, we didn't hear anything, we complained, we said, all right, if you want to remove the chapter on reproduction, that's fine, but these are expensive books and they should be returned. Niti to Bhavad. Then Rana Mashur, who is the uh, education minister, gave a press conference in which he said, Ki we cannot allow these things to happen, addressing a press conference. He said that no one would be allowed to change the basic ideology of the education system of Pakistan and stern action would be initiated against the people behind such a conspiracy. The Lahore Grammar School, the particular branch on its website, uh, I don't have the, uh, the everything that was written, but it clarified its position by saying our institution believes in inculcating values such as tolerance and empathy in all our students. The fact of religion is essentially a history of religion. It is not merely comparing religions. We aim to educate about Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, and Hinduism, and their fundamental teachings. Doing so, we believe, will enlighten our students about the importance of peaceful coexistence. This is just a small quote. It was a much bigger piece that was put on the website. A week before I came here, there was another chapa on the school. Uh, because uh, one of the schools I supervise uh, also was teaching, uh, not the math and religion, but was teaching this, uh, this science uh, textbook. And they just walked in. They said they were from the education department. They proved that they were. And they walked straight into the classroom and they started questioning the children. Of course, the books were not with them. But these are children of class 6 and 7 who got a bit confused a little intimidated and they just wanted to we we have heard reports that you have sneaked the books back here is what we were told so I will now conclude simply by saying that a it's not always possible to read against the grain it is not possible to expand on books or to add materials that we feel are essential to be truly educated in Pakistan today. And really, all the citizens of this country, and they are not all Muslims, uh, need, we need to know who people are. And we need to know more about other faiths and religions, and we certainly need not to eliminate reproductive system from our textbooks, <laughs> because that is a disaster if we are moving in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Sabina. That is really a quite, quite an experience. Uh, Dr. H. Nayar, may I ask you to Thank you, talk about the subject? Uh, uh, I think uh, what Sabina described is essentially uh, the state of uh, I believe is uh, what is otherwise called citizenship education. So this citizenship education essentially tries to uh, create some kind of um, uh, a collective feeling among the people, among among students, among citizens. Uh, um, tells them about should tell them about their rights and responsibilities, 
should tell about how society has to live with other societies in the world. Um, they have to basically inform about the world and people around them and so on. This is what um, uh, citizens, citizenship education should be about. Uh, and and, and um, um, it raises many questions over here. Uh, I think uh, some very basic questions uh, like um, what is a good citizen? Some people will argue and some people in the uh, helm of affairs certainly argue that a conformist is the best uh, uh, good citizen. Uh, whereas others will argue that a free thinker is a better citizen. Um, some will argue that a person who takes care of himself is a better citizen who doesn't indulge in, um, doesn't try to interfere with the state affairs. Others will argue that a person who devotes uh, himself to concerns of others is uh, certainly a better individual. However, whatever is told, the point is that um, uh, when it comes to uh, designing curriculum and um, uh, learning material for students, I think what we uh, need to do is to worry about uh, the students uh, becoming successful learners, good learners. They are to be taught all the learning skills properly so that they um, are less inhibited by a written word and that they are able to um, read whatever comes to them and uh, they become confident um, uh, about reading whatever opinion uh, comes their way and deciding on their own what is right and what is wrong. Not to be told by others what is right and what is wrong, but to be able to decide on their own what is right and what is wrong. And that comes in with uh, designing education in such a manner that the learners become good learners. They are given all these skills of learning. And of course, citizenship education also revolves around, you know, some basic concepts of uh, justice and rights and responsibilities and identity and diversity and so on. And it tries to inculcate among in the students critical thinking, questioning, inquiry, uh, you know, uh, and decision making. All of these things um, uh, should be a part of this um, system, which we call uh, the, the part of the education system we call citizenship education. But the observation that we have of uh, the textbooks that we that have been in currency in the country for a while in the public education system, particularly, is that they do um, what they should not do and they do not do what they should be doing. This is a very peculiar thing. They do a large number of things that they should not be doing and they do not do those things that they should be doing. And in that way, I think um, uh, I will briefly uh, describe a few things. But some of the things have already come up, but in public education, um, uh, the public text textbooks that are meant for public schools, um, they, they unnecessarily create religious divides um, uh, and try to create uh, try to, to try to create a kind of feeling among students that one religion is uh, much better than, all, better than all the others. They try to really borrow this thing from the madrasa education where there is this rad that you were talking about that you have to essentially try to show that all the others are false religions and this, this is actually the, the only uh, good religion. They, 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 they also try to create uh, uh, boundaries among cultures, among uh, ideologies, uh, religions and so on. Uh, and do not uh, create awareness of uh, rights of individuals rights of citizens, responsibilities of citizens. Um, they do not create um, empathy for, um, uh, for, for diversity that exists in society. They just do not create that kind of uh, skill among, in students to, uh, to, to, to be aware of diversity and to 
to to like this diversity and to enjoy the diversity as well as to be proud of the diversity they don't do these things um but on top of all of that what hurts me most is that they do not quite increase the learning skills of the students what is phenomenal um is that they teach uh, english language for about 10 12 years and still students remain um unskilled in the use of english language this is uh, something which uh, is only about english language then you can also extend this to other subjects also they uh, this this and then of course you would have noticed that over the years over the decades they have experimented with the teaching english um, uh, language and they have they have gone from english as second language to english as foreign language to english as as uh, you know functional english to or you know what kind, what sorts of experiments yet they fail to uh, to to make students conversant in english and i think that is something which hurts us most in these times now when the technology is available to students to explore the entire world through the web to to access knowledge from everywhere else in the world but they know that they cannot access this knowledge without english and because of this handicap they are just not able to connect with the outside world and this is something which actually is a, the one of the biggest handicaps that our students face take a, another example the science uh, education i am really pain to see some of this time science text looks they are so tedious so bad so badly written and in them there are these marvels of uh, experimentation they started off by they always say that science should be learned in english language or if urdu in urdu then science is basically taught in urdu in such a manner that very very difficult terminologies are used and then they have come up with mixing up terminologies and writing books in urdu and now in punjab at least i don't know about sin um there are science textbooks in which english terminologies are written in urdu letters so for example i saw a book which talks of endangered species written in urdu imagine how you would read this how you would imagine a child would read endangered species written in urdu and this is only one example you 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 i mean the people who write these books people who devise policies and how to teach these things do not even realize how students will respond to these things whether they will be able to learn anything or not and then lastly of course are the urge of the books to uh, somehow teach uh, religion in all the subjects that are possible in urdu in english is whatever and try and teach Uh, this religion to is to children of all faiths whoever is learning so uh, there are class 3 class 2 textbooks which contain kalma tayyaba and the students are told to memorize kalma tayyaba learn by heart by uh, also the meaning they should learn uh, the 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 dua of uh, keeping roza and uh, breaking the fast in ramzan they are told how to Uh, say durood and learn the meaning of durood and uh, you know learn them by heart without realizing that these are all to be uh, books to be read by non muslim students also um these are the things that should be within books of islamia somewhere there yet these things are included these are included partly because curriculum asks them to do this partly because there is an urge on the part of the book writers to do these things i think i should stop over here thank you thank you very much dr
and the content of textbooks that were being taught to our ordinary students in public schools. And uh, Nair, you will remember those, uh, that Mutalia Pakistan textbook, which said that the ideal Muslim is that who yearns for Chash and Zawad. Yes. They said the ideal Muslim society would be one in which uh, Muslims, when they greet each other, will be asking each other for the prayer timings of Chash and Zawad. <laughs> <laughs> now, at that time, it seemed as if these things would, were so stupid that students would reject them. And indeed, Rubina, it is true that uh, students initially did reject them. They didn't internalize it. But over time, this has been internalized. <coughs> there was a survey carried out on young people by the Pew Global Survey, and it asked the question, do you want Sharia in Pakistan? And 87% of those over the age of 15 said, yes, we must have a Sharia Nizam in Pakistan. So is it a surprise that today we are moving step, we are retreating in the face of the Taliban assault, unable, unwilling to confront them, in spite of being a nuclear state, armed with tanks, with having the seventh largest army in the world. The reason that we fail to confront terrorism with a religious face is because those textbooks did do their job. If 87% of our youth wants Sharia, never mind that when it comes, they will be most deeply disappointed and that some of them will in fact turn against it and may even fight against it. But they have been so convinced into the superiority of the Islamic way of life that this is what they want now. So it is no surprise that you have the Nasim Hijazi version of history in our books that East Pakistan was all a Hindu plot that the Bengalis were traitors, all the things that you said. Now, I ask myself, is this something that's limited to us here in Pakistan, or is it, does it go beyond? I was reading very recently about how the education system and the society in Indonesia is changing. Indonesia is a bunch of different islands and Islam came to them originally in the form of traders. It didn't come to them in the violent way as over here. But it was through a steady process of conversion. There were animus over there, and therefore the indigenous Islam that developed was uh, amazingly different from that over here. So in fact, if you go to the Indonesian embassy, you will see a big murti over there of some god. And uh, <coughs> beneath that is the kalma. So it's very different from the kind of Islam that is represented, let's say, in Pakistan today, and very, very different from Saudi Arabia. However, what is happening now is a very interesting transformation. Indigenous Islam in Indonesia is being replaced by degrees with the Wahhabi Islam of Saudi Arabia. And this process has now become so clear and so advanced that if you see Indonesian women at Dubai airport, for example, they all look the same and they look very different from what they used to look like 10 years, 15 years ago. The transformation that we are seeing in Pakistan is really part of the global transformation that is happening in Islam. And so to me, the interesting question is, why is this happening? And I think that the answers put forward by a number of people who study this issue is that the, in the conflict between modernity, 
modern values and Islam, there is now a deeply defensive reaction. That reaction is to close up against the West, against modern ideas, and to create a utopia which is self-contained. As part of that, you have to have textbooks, you have to have an education system that will guard against the intrusion of foreign ideas. Hence, the reason they cannot allow you to teach pluralism about other religions is that, uh, well, this will weaken the faith. And who knows, it might actually do that. <laughs> so, we understand this. There is a logic to it. There is a logic to it. The question is, where will Pakistan be five years from now, 20 years from now? And that's really now what we have to think about. And I know that was the question that you had in mind and you raised. Thank you. Thank you, Parvez. Very quickly, I just want to add to what Rubina had said uh, that uh, with every regime, the focus and the theme of uh, textbooks change. Actually, that started from 1962 when Ayub Khan created the textbook boards. And each province had a textbook board with a monopoly to publish uh, textbooks for, for that province. From 1947, actually, Lahore was the publishing center of undivided India. Uh, but in 47, a lot of the Hindu publishers from Lahore migrated. But even so, there were quite a lot of um, very good Muslim publishers, uh, Sheikh Shokat Ali and Sons, and uh, uh, there were several of them who were publishing very good books and they were publishing textbooks. And they were doing very well because those textbooks were being used in, uh, in all schools throughout the country. And that's why they were more liberal. So for 15 years, actually, publishing flourished. Uh, and uh, because uh, these uh, textbook publishers had uh, an open market, they were, they were competing with each other, the quality was good because competition drives up standards. However, in um, all this drive, and then they, uh, because they were doing well, they were publishing uh, general books, books for adults and academic books. And because they were using their the turnover from school publishing and they were uh, using some of that to publish um, academic, general, scholarly books. So actually publishing was thriving. In 1962 when Ayub Khan introduced the textbook boards, created that monopoly, those textbook boards could then only publish for government schools. That is I think when the lot set in, really. Uh, however, now I think there's been a change in, a, in the sense that uh, private schools are now, I believe, almost 40%, 40% of children now go to private schools. And I think that's why they're feeling so threatened. And that's why they're attacking Lohar Grammar School. And you know, another school in Karachi was sealed because they too were using a biology book. We were at, uh, also taken to task because we also showed uh, reproduction in, uh, in our biology textbook. And uh, I said, but how else do we teach children reproduction? They said that uh, you can teach them how uh, frogs and horses we produce. Children are now moving from uh, government to private schools. And you know, my experience has been as a publisher of textbooks, uh, we are actually doing very well as publishers of textbooks because private schools are using our textbooks. Uh, but you know, the Government schools are completely close to us. We cannot supply any books to, to government schools. Um, so that is where they have kept complete control of the material that uh, children are using in their school. And I think as Dr. Nayar, as you mentioned, they teach the same uh, you know, religion in history, whether it's in history, Pakistan studies, social studies. So as I think uh, Batul Ali said that we are suffering from uh, repetitis. Um, so I'd like to now open the floor to questions. Ji, uh, Madhya. I think it's, it's not I mean, obviously the textbooks and I think it's been uh, talked about uh, really very 
very candidly. But it's also the teachers, I mean, which are products of the 80s now. Most school teachers, young school teachers, and uh, middle-aged school teachers. Uh, I mean, even if the textbooks which you are supplying are there, but I know because uh, my children are obviously studying in I mean, private schools, was I mean, studying. Okay. Uh, and uh, what is it that the teachers are teaching them? Because their mindsets have all, they have internalized that whole ideology. So I don't think it's just a matter of now changing uh, or giving better, more objective textbooks. Because what are you to do with those teachers? How are you going to change that uh, very sinister ideology which has been internalized by them and which they are now transmitting to students with or without the textbooks? Right. Can we take three questions and then answer them? Amin Ashwani, please. Uh, Could you give the mic? To it's fine. I'll just shout. That's fine. Uh, Hi. Uh, Pervez, you mentioned that uh, the trend is that, you know, in 10 years, 15 years' time, we're getting more and more radicalized uh, and perhaps more polarized as well. And uh, I don't see anything dramatically happening to reverse this particular trend. Um, and with this polarized society, um, if we start saying that you guys are wrong and we are right, then we'll be speaking the same language on both sides of the divide. Uh, and uh, uh, so, is there anything we could look at out of the box, if we cannot reverse this trend, at least we can lessen its impact vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis in terms of violence, division in our society and try and uh, come up with some kind of a platform. I'm saying that this is assuming that, you know, these, this trend does not reverse and I do not see this thing reversing. Thank you. Um, Batul, I think you wanted to ask a question. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed. Uh, and Af Abela after that. Ji, aap please Bela ko de if mic. Right there. Uh, that was so stimulating and inspiring. But, you know, uh, the thing is that uh, Amina does these uh, workshops on copyrights. We have so many things happening, informing the public awareness. We have a 2006 national curriculum, which in fact was a response precisely to these kind of discussions that we are having. And it is a, a quite a reasonable uh, national curriculum. And in fact, with it, in 2007, was also the policy to deregulate textbooks. And then subsequently, 2010, we have the 18th Amendment and each province to do their own textbooks. Now, everything is a complete mess between what is the official policy, official national curriculum, and actually what happens or gets transacted in the production of textbooks and the content that is finalized and then the way it is taught and then the way the media um, gets its, uh, uh, you know, bit of uh, attention that it seeks and then the kind of atrocities that are continued in the classrooms. Now, on the 16th of January, uh, Essen Iqbal um, had a very major statement at the launch of the Asa report that um, he is very perturbed and he is going to call all the provinces to the national platform to talk about the need for one national curriculum and to ensure that there is some kind of a standardization. Now, between what Parvez has said, just said now and what we've heard from the exact, exact examples and what Amina has said as well, what is going to be that standardization? And if the public, because abhi tak, I mean, ye bogusness se hum nikal nahi paaye hai, in spite of all the work that has been done by many, many good people in this. So, textbook ka masla bahi hai, agar sindh kya haal dekhe, to khun kya asu insaan baise hi rota hai. Because it's the first year after 2007 that we have class 1 textbooks done in violation of the deregulation policy. Magar public ko iske baare mein pata nahi hai. Kaise aap log ki kya raha hai, kyunki ye sab cheezen toh ho rahi hai. Ye national policies apni jaga hai, national curriculum apni jaga hai. और अब जो बात हो रही है कि फिर से एक नेशनल डायलॉग हो और फिर क्या उसमें आएगा और किस तरह से उसको इंटरप्रेट किया जाएगा दिस आर वेरी सीरियस मैटर्स एंड आर चिल्ड्रन आर सफरिंग एंड द नेक्स्ट जनरेशंस विल सफर एंड सोसाइटल नॉर्म्स विल कंटिन्यू टू बी व्हाटेवर सो आई डोंट नो व्हाट इज व्हाट कैन वी डू बतूल अली यहां दे दिए 
too many, then we'll forget. Acha. <laughs> okay, uh, Batul, can we just answer these two and then who would so, like to? I, Parvez? Okay. I think, uh, I mean, the question you've asked is really the fundamental one. They are so powerful. They have scared the, they have scared a state which is the seventh largest military in the world. We are unarmed citizens. Can't we simply say, you're right and we're right, we'll, let's not quarrel? I wish we could take that attitude. But then, what do you do about Samina? She wants to teach, very rightly so how humans can reproduce. It's, it's essential. She wants to tell them about what other religions are and that's the way education ought to be. They won't let you do it. If there is a national curriculum that is common to everybody, we know what that will contain. Therefore, there should not be a national curriculum. Given the situation that we are in, the only thing that we can hope for are little enclaves where people who want to take the initiative can do at least something for their community, for their little bit of society. Because if you have something that is overall, like Imran Khan says he will do, huh? yes. let's not forget that was one of his election promises. Well, what did he do when he went to KPK? The, the little bit of improvement that the ANP had made by exorcising some of the most violent verses from there, they were put right back in. I don't, I don't have an answer for you, but I say, let's do what we can. Let's not have an overall curriculum given these circumstances. Thank you. G. Ruby. I mean, historically, Bela, I mean, I agree with you that the national curriculum has always been oriented towards Islamization. Even during Ayub Khan's time, the idea of the integration of all the provinces was Islam, Hamara, Mazhab, and we are all one, and we should forget we are Balochis. But on the other hand, there is a, the argument on the other side also that uh, uh, the Constitution contains a chapter called Fundamental Rights. Now, why can we not have a national curriculum that is based on those rights because that part of the constitution belongs to all the provinces plus the international commitment signed by Pakistan on CRC, CEDO and uh, UDHR and all which say that human rights, basic rights, fundamental rights and that will become citizenship education instead of uh, you know how to produce Muslim citizens because what is happening is increasingly I've seen in the latest textbooks there's a change in the past, I mean in Ayub's time, they used to talk a lot about nation building, nation building. Then there was the building of the citizen. Let's make the citizen, the, uh, let's create the state because all nations already exist in Pakistan, several nations exist. Now again there is, in the latest civics textbooks, there is this addition of let's build a nation. Let's somehow erase these older identities of Sindhi, Punjabi, Pashtun, etc. And let's create, uh, do nation building. That's where the problem comes because we are not doing state building. And in my mind, I was thinking of a comparison with India. During the BJP time, they tried to have a national curriculum in which there was this, it was totally anti-Muslim, anti-Pakistan. But then NSERT got Krishan Kumar there and then Krishan Kumar produced those wonderful, wonderful textbooks which are now used. Uh, and they were uh, uh, produced nationally by NSERT in India. And they are excellent textbooks, the best I've ever seen. So, uh, I think we can have a national curriculum, provided it's not based on what Ehsan Iqbal or uh, Abid Sher Ali was saying in the Standing Committee on Education, in the, but on uh, fundamental rights which every province shares. Thank you. Ji, um, oh sorry, Batul Ali and… Ji, uh, ji, of course, of course. Bila, I was going to make a comment on this. What Ehsan Iqbal said was that it's a problem. لیکن ان کا جو آرگومنٹ ہے وہ یہ ہے کہ مختلف پروونسز کے پبلک ایڈوکیشن سسٹمز کے سٹینڈرز مختلف ہو جائیں گے وہ آئیڈیالوجی کی بات نہیں کر رہے وہ سٹینڈرز کی بات کر رہے ہیں ہم لوگوں کو چاہیے کہ ہم بحث کو وہیں پہ ہی رہنے دیں 
और स्टैंडर्ड्स के वास्ते आगे जाकर उनको बताएं कि स्टैंडर्ड्स हम कैसे डिफाइन करते हैं और इनको अगर आप बना दें सेंटर की से, सेंटर से तो फिर आप स्टैंडर्ड्स को यूनिफॉर्म रख सकते हैं ये हमें प्रोएक्टिवली करना चाहिए कि स्टैंडर्ड्स बनाकर उनके सामने रखने चाहिए कि ठीक है आपका एतराज़ ठीक है आप ही ले लीजिए लेकिन हमें फिर भी मालूम है कि ये तो उन्होंने बहाना बनाया है असल चीज़ जो है वो तो आइडियोलॉजिकल इंटरवेंशन है जो वो हर सूरत में करेंगे तो बाकी काम जो है वो हमें करना चाहिए अलग से जी बतूल that uh, regardless of what curriculum who makes the curriculum for us in the is it national or provincial or whatever but please for schools have people with experience of teaching in schools make the curriculum because some of our curricula for instance geography it is what i can only be termed hofna and if you translate that into urdu it reads like an old arabic manual on medicine <laughs> falao ul fala and falao ul fala oh my god the other day my husband was given some dates which had orange peel in them and it was written harshal portugal harshal portugal portugal and he said what is this i said khashar means the outer layer portugal is portugal therefore orange is it means orange peel <laughs> and i said he said how do you know i said thanks to geography <laughs> so please fayda to hua fayda to hua na dekhi aur dusre ye ki by putting in the textbooks questions that encourage critical thinking that is very important ji uh, i am afraid last question ismat riaz who has written history textbooks the jaldi se de Materials. Um, first, I would just like to correct uh, something that I mean. I agree with Bela that the 2006 curriculum is on the right uh, right lines. I don't think it is that ideologically uh, infused. Now, for the history text that I wrote for the 2006 curriculum, includes the Hindu period, the uh, Buddhist period. all of those and religion are mentioned along the, throughout the three books so so far so good except for geography which was not i think proper experts which uh, should deal with school uh, education but on the whole i think once the reversal is there and general musharraf's 2006 curriculum did do the job but what we need is good educational methodology to be able to write those books correctly uh, with people who have good command of both urdu and english as far as uh, these textbooks are written in such poor english or poor urdu the rot will continue and many meanings can be taken out of language which is not clear and simple for the student as well as for the teacher thank you thank you i think we've run out of time Thank you very much and I would like to thank our speakers for their contribution. Assalamu alaikum.